That day, March 5th, 2000, started like any other flight. Southwest Airlines Flight 1455 took off from McCarran International Airport, bound for the airport in California. Passengers settled into their seats. The crew prepared for what they thought would be a routine flight. Little did they know by the time the flight touched down, they would be facing a life or death situation. The airport's runway was short, and after a day of rain, it was slippery. The pilots needed to land carefully, but they weren't prepared for the challenges that awaited them. As the plane descended, the crew knew they had to make the landing count. The runway was getting closer, but so was the danger. They were running out of options fast, and every decision they made in those crucial moments would determine the outcome. So what went wrong? How did a minor error snowball into a catastrophic risk? Stick around, because we're about to reveal exactly what happened on that fateful day. This is the story of Southwest Airlines Flight 1455. It was Sunday afternoon on March 5th, 2000, like any other, or so it seemed. Passengers at McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, Nevada, hurried through the terminal, carrying their luggage, grabbing quick snacks, and checking departure screens. Among them were the travelers booked on Southwest Airlines Flight 1455, a short-haul flight to Burbank Glendale Pasadena Airport in California. For most, this was just another flight, nothing out of the ordinary. Some were heading home, others off to visit family, and a few were likely flying for business. The relaxed atmosphere of a Southwest Airlines flight, known for its casual service and friendly crew, meant that passengers were at ease, unaware that this trip would become anything but routine. The familiar sensation of liftoff was expected, a smooth rise into the sky. However, the weather that day was the first sign that this wasn't going to be a smooth ride. The skies over Las Vegas had been turbulent, and a series of storms in the area delayed the flight's departure. By the time Flight 1455 was ready for takeoff, conditions were still less than ideal. Though the weather had cleared up somewhat by the time the plane was airborne, it was still a concern for the flight crew. Wind speeds were higher than usual, and there was a significant amount of moisture in the air. These conditions, combined with the heavy rain and slick runway at Burbank, would soon prove to be a dangerous mix. As the plane ascended into the air, the crew was aware that the weather had taken a toll on their timing, and they would have to make up for lost time during the flight. The crew knew that these conditions could make for a tricky landing, especially at Burbank's shorter runway. Despite this, there was an air of confidence. They were experienced professionals, trained to handle the unexpected. The aircraft itself, a Boeing 737-3T5, had been in service for several years, and though it was an older model, it had undergone routine maintenance and was considered to be in good working condition. However, the challenges ahead weren't going to be about the aircraft's mechanical ability, it was going to be about the human element, the crew, and their decisions during a critical moment. The captain was 52-year-old Howard Peterson, who had been with Southwest Airlines since 1988 and had logged 11,000 flight hours, including 9,870 hours on the Boeing 737. The first officer was 43-year-old Jeffrey D. Irwin, who had been with Southwest Airlines since 1995 and had 5,032 flight hours, with 2,522 of them on the Boeing 737. Together, they were prepared to handle what came their way, but no amount of experience could fully prepare them for what would unfold in the minutes leading up to their arrival in Burbank. As Flight 1455 left McCarran International Airport at 1650, it was already more than two hours behind schedule. The delayed departure wasn't the crew's fault. They had been waiting for the storms to pass, and when they finally did, they were given the green light to take off. The flight was bound for Burbank Glendale Pasadena Airport, a short hop of just over 200 miles, typically a quick and uneventful journey. Inside the cabin, passengers settled in, some reading, others napping, and a few chatting with seatmates. Flight attendants moved up and down the aisle, offering Southwest's usual relaxed and friendly service. From the outside, it looked like an uneventful flight. The goal was simple, get the plane safely on the ground. But as the aircraft neared its final destination, the conditions were less than ideal. The wind picked up and the rain began to fall harder. There were whispers among the crew about the landing speed, but for now they focused on the task at hand. In the cockpit, the crew was laser focused, trying to balance speed and control in the face of the challenging weather conditions. They knew that getting the plane safely to the ground would require precision, and the longer the flight took, the greater the possibility of complications. 
The first officer checked the runway length at Burbank, noting the challenging conditions on the ground. They were working against time, and their landing would need to be executed flawlessly. But the crew also knew that the runway was shorter than usual, and any mistake could lead to disaster. Before we dive into what went wrong on Flight 1455, make sure to hit that like button. It helps more people discover these deep dive aviation stories. As Flight 1455 neared Burbank, the sun had already dipped low in the sky. This was going to be a tricky landing. Burbank Airport, officially known as Burbank Glendale Pasadena Airport at the time, had a reputation among pilots. Unlike larger airports with miles of runway to work with, Burbank's Runway 8 was one of the shortest runways in commercial aviation, just 6,032 feet long. It was far shorter than most of the pilots would prefer when landing a fully loaded airplane. Southwest Airlines had operated flights in Burbank for years, and its pilots were fully aware of the tight margins required for safe landing. But tonight, the challenge was even greater. The rain that had delayed their departure in Las Vegas had made its way south, leaving the runway at Burbank slick and unforgiving. Wet runways reduce braking effectiveness, meaning the aircraft would need additional stopping distance. The pilots knew that touching down at the right speed was critical, too fast, and there wouldn't be enough room to stop. As they began their descent, air traffic control in Burbank provided instructions for their approach. The controller cleared them for a landing on runway 8, the preferred runway for arriving flights. Everything seemed routine at first, but then a complication occurred. At 180402, as Flight 1455 approached from 19 nautical miles north of Burbank's outer marker, Southern California Approach Control issued a crucial instruction. Maintain 230 knots or greater until further notice. This was an unusually high speed for an approach into Burbank. The order was meant to keep Flight 1455 in sequence between two other aircraft. The captain acknowledged the command, but didn't anticipate the consequences of maintaining such a high speed so late into the approach. In aviation, this is known as an unstabilized approach. It is a scenario where the aircraft is not in the correct configuration, speed, or altitude required for a safe landing. Now here's where things start to go very wrong. What would you do if you were in the cockpit? Comment your thoughts below. As Flight 1455 lined up with Runway 8, the tension in the cockpit grew. The aircraft was coming in too fast. The Boeing 737-300 typically lands at a speed of 130 to 140 knots, but Flight 1455 was approaching at a dangerously high speed of nearly 182 knots, about 182 knots, 210 miles per hour. The first officer who was monitoring the instruments saw the numbers creeping higher than they should be. The correct decision in this situation would have been to go around and abort the landing and try again. But at this stage, the captain committed to landing. At 1811, Flight 1455 slammed into the wet runway at a speed of 182 knots, a full 44 knots over the target landing speed. Worse still, Instead of touching down in the first 1,000 to 1,500 feet of the runway, the aircraft made contact 2,150 feet past the threshold, reducing the available stopping distance significantly. Ideally, a Boeing 737 should land closer to the threshold, giving pilots ample time to decelerate. Instead, Flight 1455 made contact almost two-thirds of the way down the short 6,032-foot strip. This left them with a mere 1,750 feet to come to a full stop, an almost impossible task under these conditions. The runway lights flashed past the cockpit windows in a blur. Inside, the pilots had only seconds to act. The captain immediately applied full brakes, deploying the thrust reversers to slow the aircraft. But the wet conditions worked against them, water on the runway significantly reduced braking efficiency, and the tires struggled to gain traction. The first officer, who was monitoring the speed, could see that they were still barreling forward at a dangerously high rate. At this point, every second counted. The pilots desperately needed the aircraft to slow down, but instead it felt as though they were skimming across the pavement. By now, the pilots realized the gravity of their situation. The end of the runway was rapidly approaching, and there was nothing they could do to stop in time. The emergency brakes were engaged. The thrust reversers roared, but the aircraft was still moving too fast. In those final moments, there was a horrifying realization. They were going off the runway. Beyond the end of the pavement lay the airport boundary, a busy street, and directly ahead, a Chevron gas station. 
At approximately 40 miles per hour, the Boeing 737-300 burst through the airport's perimeter fence, its nose smashing onto Hollywood Way, a major road just outside the airport. For a terrifying moment, it seemed as though the aircraft would continue forward into traffic or, worse, plow into the gas station just a few hundred feet away. But by sheer luck and the pilot's last-ditch efforts, the aircraft came to a stop just short of a catastrophic impact. The pilots, fully aware of how close they had come to disaster, quickly assessed the situation. In the cabin, flight attendants acted quickly, following emergency procedures. Despite the impact, the aircraft remained intact and there was no fire, a critical factor that helped prevent further injuries. Over the intercom, the captain made the call. This is the captain. Evacuate the aircraft. Flight attendants wasted no time, opening the doors and deploying emergency slides. Passengers, still in shock, scrambled to grab their belongings, but the crew urged them to move quickly. Some hesitated, others cried, but within minutes everyone was out. As emergency crews rushed to the scene, the flight's cockpit voice recorder, CVR, captured the captain's immediate reaction. Well, there goes my career. It was a stark acknowledgement of what had just happened, a preventable accident caused by a high-speed approach, ignored warnings, and a failure to abort the landing when it was clear they were coming in too fast. On the wet pavement, passengers stood in disbelief. They had come dangerously close to a tragedy, yet all 142 people on board had survived. However, two passengers suffered serious injuries, and many others had minor cuts and bruises. Paramedics arrived to assess the injured, while fire crews inspected the aircraft for leaks or damage that could cause further danger. Southwest Airlines immediately dispatched representatives to assist passengers and coordinate their transport. The airline later stated that all passengers would be provided with alternative flights and support. Within hours of the crash, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, and Federal Aviation Administration, us FAA, arrived on site. Their goal was clear determine what went wrong and prevent it from happening again. Their first priority was to retrieve the flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders from the wreckage. At the same time, investigators also took statements from the pilots, air traffic controllers, and passengers. They needed to understand the human factors at play. That means what decisions were made and what instructions were given from air control. After months of analysis, the NTSB released its report identifying three critical factors that contributed to the incident. One excessive approach speed. Flight 1455 was dangerously high speeds during its final approach and landing. The excessive speed significantly reduced the pilot's ability to slow down to bring the aircraft to a safe stop. And Flight 1455 was still traveling at a dangerously high speed when it touched down too far down the runway. Two, wet runway conditions. On the day of the accident, the runway was damp from earlier rainfall, creating an additional challenge for the pilots. A wet runway reduces the friction between the tires and the pavement, making it much harder to stop, even with full braking applied. The Boeing 737-300 was equipped with anti-skid braking and thrust reversers, but given the combination of high speed and wet conditions, these systems simply weren't enough to bring the aircraft to a halt within the available runway distance. Three and the most contributing factor was air traffic control's role. The controllers at Burbank Tower had placed flight 1455 in a tight approach pattern that gave the pilots little time to adjust. The only real option they had was to go around, but they didn't. The NTSB ultimately blamed pilot error as the primary cause, stating that the crew's decision to continue landing instead of aborting led to the overrun. Months later, the pilots were fired as a result of this incident. Southwest Airlines admitted the pilot's actions were negligent. However, the investigation also pointed out a major issue, Burbank's short runway. At just 6,032 feet, runway eight was one of the shortest for commercial jets. The lack of a proper safety zone beyond the pavement made overruns far more dangerous. The gas station missed by the aircraft was later closed and demolished due to safety concerns. The lot became dedicated green space. As a result of the findings, the NTSB and FAA pushed for several critical safety changes. One was Engineered Materials Arrestor System, EMAS. It is a special collapsible material, 
designed to slow down aircraft that overrun a runway. This was later installed at Burbank Airport's Runway 8 to prevent future accidents. Another was pilot training improvements. Airlines, including Southwest, reviewed training procedures to ensure pilots better understood when to abort a landing and initiate a go-around. Third changes was the re-evaluation of air traffic control procedures. Controllers were advised to adjust approach patterns to avoid forcing aircraft into tight, high-speed descents. For Southwest Airlines, Flight 1455 was a wake-up call. The airline had built a reputation for safety, and this was its first major accident in 29 years of operation. The public needed reassurance. Southwest immediately cooperated with investigators, ensuring transparency throughout the process. The airline also reviewed its training programs, emphasizing better decision-making under pressure. Despite the overrun, Southwest's safety record remained strong, and passengers continued to trust the airline. Southwest Airlines Flight 1455 could have ended in tragedy, but it didn't. It became a lesson in aviation safety, proving once again that every second in the cockpit matters. Thanks to the changes made in its aftermath, Airports are now better prepared for overruns, pilots are better trained to recognize unstable approaches, and air traffic controllers have clearer guidelines for ensuring safe landings. A disaster was avoided that day in Burbank, but the industry never forgot what happened. If you enjoyed this deep dive into Flight 1455, don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss another aviation breakdown. What do you think was the biggest mistake in this flight? Let us know in the comments.